Okay, let's get started. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name's Karina Love. I'm the chair of the Book of the Year Committee. And this year, we are very pleased uh, for Hector Tabar to come and speak to us about Barbarian Nurseries. So I'm going to do a few thank yous um, to the Academic Senate, who is our um, organization that um, sponsors us, Friends of the Cuesta Library, um, Associated Students of uh, Cuesta College, uh, the Cuesta Equity, Student Equity Committee, uh, and uh, the Cultural Diversity and Student Equity Committee were all sponsors this year, so thank you to them for making this happen. And please take a moment to support the, the Friends of the Library. There's a little sheet out there, so that I have to give that plug, or my boss comes out and does it for me afterwards. <laughs> Um, and then I also wanted to mention, we did a really special thing this year. We did some outreach to local high school students that are coming to Cuesta College for a conference, a Jacate, and um, hopefully will be coming to Cuesta College. So we, we did some book clubs with them, and a lot of them are here today. We have students from Morro Bay High School, from um, Paso Robles High, Cambria, and San Luis Obispo High, and hopefully, hopefully there's some of you from all those places. <laughs> um, so I think that that's, um, we're going to have book signing afterwards. Um, after um, uh, Hector speaks, we'll have a Q&A, um, and the, there are microphones on the side, so people can come up and line up and ask questions. And right now, um, I'd like to introduce our Dean of North County and South County Center, Maria Escobar, to... Um, Wow, that was a long walk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, again, my name's Maria Escobedo. I'm the dean of the North County Campus and South County Center. So I'm at both ends of the campus. I just joined the Cuesta family a, a little over a year ago, and it's been a fantastic experience for me. Uh, but again, I was, uh, thank you very much for all of you for coming out this evening and joining us this evening with Ecor Tobar. I want to thank the Academic Senate Committee that is comprised of our faculty, a wonderful faculty, our staff, a student, and an off-campus off community members for their selection of this year's Book of the Year, The Barbarian Nurseries. I was asked by Ms. Karina to be part of this great annual event, and my role would be to introduce Mr. Tobar, which has been a pleasure. It was an honor to have this opportunity, which meant now that I needed to read the book like any other student, to be able to give a good understanding of what the heck I was going to be talking about. Now I had some homework ahead of me, and like with any good student, they gave me the book about two, three months ago, and about a month ago I said, oh, I think I need to read the book. So just like being a student and always a, a lifelong learner is that I'm always learning, and I learned a lot from Mr. Tovar. As I read the book, aside from being a great read, Mr. Tovar raised so many social issues within the context of the book by telling the story about a woman and the challenges that she encountered while trying to make a living and starting a different life. The book, The Barbarian Nurseries, is quite a compelling novel. It has a strong sense of place. The setting takes place in Southern California, Los Angeles, and Orange Counties. If you've ever lived there or driven by there, there might, there, excuse me, you live there, immediately you recognize the freeways, the gated Orange County coastal suburbs, Union Station, and other places depicted in the book. And with any book, you find a connection. For me, I found a connection with this book as it, at various levels, such as when the author mentions Bakersfield. I moved from Bakersfield two years ago, and I still travel back and forth. As a majority of my formative years, I lived in a small rural agricultural community southeast of Bakersfield. When I was eight years of age, my family, all nine of us, later years we became 10, moved to the San Joaquin Valley in California from Mexicali, Baja California, which also Mr. Tovar makes reference to in Mexicali. As a young girl, I did not understand, excuse me, as a young girl, I did not understand the sacrifices that my parents 
made to give their children an opportunity for a different life. I experienced, as with Araceli did in the book, what it was like to be in a place where you did not speak the language. For me, one of my fond memories was entering the second grade, not being able to speak or understand the English language. I remember being in the class and just looking around, not understanding what the kids were saying. However, because of a dynamic teacher, Mrs. Easter, and I still keep her in my heart, this transition to this new world was less painful. In addition, the book outlines important themes and current themes such as immigration, especially from Latin America, excuse me, immigrants, especially from Latin America, assimilation, and the citizenship issues of what new immigrants experience in coming to the United States, the lifestyles of people with ample resources and those without, and the 24-hour media circus that we live in today. Having worked within the court system, I can relate to the court processes and the, and the scenes Tovar describes in the book. The book also brings, the author also, excuse me, the book brings to light the author's sense of humor in, the, in pointing out that at the quirkiness of each character. I truly enjoy the characters of this book. Finally, for students, these themes tie into classroom discussions about social issues in communities, multicultural neighborhoods, and assimilation and what that means. This book brings awareness to several social issues, not only in our, within our communities, but throughout our nation and beyond. Having the author here with us today provides us all the opportunities to hear from a very successful writer. Oh, excuse me, I lost my spot. From a very successful writer, how someone can pursue a career in journalism and writing. He can share with us what inspires him to write and to tell the stories that need to be told. Hector Tovar is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and novelist. He is the author of various books, such as our current read, The Barbarian Nurseries, Translation Nation, The Tattooed Soldier, and his most recent book, Deep Down Dark, The Untold Stories of 33 Men Buried in a Chilean Mine and the Miracle That Set Them Free. He is the son of a Guatemalan immigrant and is a native of the city of Los Angeles where he lives with his wife and three children. He has had the opportunity to travel throughout the world, Mexico, Nicaragua, Argentina, and other places in the world. As a result of his travels, he has written many stories, just to mention a few. When Jail is a Mental Institution, The Barrios, Fields of Dreams, The Quiet Dead of Nuevo Laredo's Drug Wars, Bolivia's Caldron of Rebellion, and The American Who Died with the rebels in El Salvador. It is my pleasure to bring Mr. Tovar up to the stage, and you are in for a wonderful treat this afternoon. Sir. Uh, thank you, Maestra for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to Cuesta College uh, for bringing me out here uh, from the wilds of Los Angeles, uh, crossing over many mountain ranges to get here. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, my book, The Barbarian Nurseries, well actually a lot about it, and also a little bit about my career as a writer and how I came to write this book. Um, like many writers, uh, when I went to school, it was with the idea that I would change the world and um, that I would make the world a better place to live in with my ideas and my writing. Um, but, and this book is born of some of that impulse, but also it's a, a product of a very personal family struggle um, to be thought of as an intelligent person, uh, to feel like one counts as an individual. Um, I became a writer Maybe it was fate, because there is illiteracy in my family. Um, I used to write a column for the LA Times uh, a few years back, and in one of those columns, um, I wrote about adult illiteracy uh, in Southern California. 
Um, you may not know this, but it's sort of an epidemic, a very low level epidemic. There are probably tens of thousands of people in Southern California, adults, who cannot read and write. Uh, many of them are immigrant women from Latin America. And I discovered this uh, and wrote a, a, a piece about a writing center that teaches adult women and men, uh, but especially women, to read and write. Uh, it's an epidemic in Latin America because um, uh, in rural societies, the rural societies that have tended to send their uh, women uh, to migrate to the United States, a lot of uh, families decide that it doesn't really make any sense to send a girl to school in a rural community in Mexico or Guatemala or Honduras because the girl's only gonna get married anyway. And so there is a lot of undereducation of young women in Latin America. And so I wrote this, this column about what it's like to learn how to read and write. And um, after it was published, uh, my father showed up at my house. Uh, my father is a Guatemalan immigrant himself. Um, 70 years old now, uh, 70 plus years old. Uh, and he showed up at my door and he had a very stricken look on his face. And he said, I read your column and I have something to tell you. And from the look on his face, I really thought he was gonna tell me that I had a little brother that I didn't know about, you know? <laughs> uh, Latino families, that sometimes happens. And so uh, he, instead, he brought out a color Xerox of my grandmother's passport, of his mother's passport, and she said, I have something to tell you. You wrote this thing about illiteracy, and I never wanted, I kept this secret from you for 40 years, but your grandmother, my mother, could not read and write. She was illiterate, and he brought out her passport and showed it to me. And uh, she had died uh, several years earlier, uh, but her passport, which she used to come and visit us in the United States, her Guatemalan passport, had uh, her picture in black and white, and in the space where she should have signed, there was an X, and a bureaucrat, a Guatemalan official, had written, Ignora firmar, does not know how to read and write. And at that moment, a lot of things became clear to me. I remembered how much my father, when I was growing up, always told me how reading and, and writing was such a special thing. Uh, my father was someone who left his own country, Guatemala, uh, at the age of 20, but with only a fourth grade education. He had had to dro drop out of school uh, at age uh, 11 or so um, because his grandmother, his mother, kidnapped him from an abusive stepmother, and he had stopped his education. And so when I was a little kid, he was um, going to night school. So he was reading books like The Jungle, by Upton Sinclair, one of the first novels I ever read. He also was really into, it's very strange for a Guatemalan immigrant, he was really into Dale Carnegie. You know, <laughs> how to win friends and influence people. And, um, and when he went to a school like this one, his education is that he has an A degree, so he, came to, he went to a community college to LA Trade Tech and LA City College in Los Angeles. He uh, took history classes, um, I still have his American history textbook with all the things that he underlined in it, which was one of my wonderful things to read when I was a kid growing up, was to peruse my dad's history textbook from community college. And he also um, would photograph me. Uh, he would take pictures of me. He took a photography class at, at his community college. And he would take pictures of me posed like this <laughs> with books on either side of me. And... Um, and I remember the first really expensive present I can remember my father giving me was the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, first edition. Beautiful book, hefty book, um, filled with illustrations. I, to this day, I've bought all five of the editions that have been published since. And I'm pretty sure my father went to Pickwick Books on Hollywood Boulevard and splurged on this dictionary. And it meant a lot to me when I was a kid, but as an adult, um, hearing the story from my father about my grandmother's illiteracy, I realized uh, a truth about my life, which was that this man, whose mother could not read or write a word in any language, had given his son all the words in English. And so, of course, I became a writer. A and when I became a writer, it was, um, it was in part, to rescue and to tell that history of the people uh, who uh, gave birth to me, uh, the people of Guatemala, 
and the people of Los Angeles. Um, my father told me stories when I was growing up about the dictatorship in Guatemala that existed, um, brutal, violent, death squad dictatorship that ruled the country from the coup in 1954, which my father remembered. He was then 11 years old and, excuse me, 13 years old. He remembered diving under the desks at, um, at the orphanage where he worked. He worked at an orphanage, diving under the tables uh, because the city was being bombed. Guatemala was a dictatorship. He told me those stories. And so my novel, my first novel, The Tattooed Soldier, uh, was a novel about uh, Guatemala and Los Angeles and how these two places were linked. Because Guatemala was a place of injustice and violence and war, but the LA that I grew up in was a city of opportunity. I mean, most of us here are Californians. Many of us are of a certain age. Uh, these might not be the brightest times, but we remember the golden age of California. We remember uh, those uh, brand new public schools. We remember um, that time of optimism when the freeways were still being built. Uh, one of my earliest childhood memories is of driving to the end of the Pomona Freeway in LA. And uh, when it was still, uh, you know, when it ended in orange groves and you had to get off and the cement was going off into the orange groves. And so my first novel, The Tattooed Soldier, was an attempt to reconcile these worlds. This Los Angeles of gleaming new, uh, s gleaming new highways, the Los Angeles that sent, uh, that's, that, that helped build uh, the rockets that sent people to the moon with that Guatemala of dictatorship and violence and war. And I went off to UCI, UC Irvine, and got an MFA uh, in creative writing, and I wrote my first novel, The Tattooed Soldier. And um, while I was writing that, I'd finished it and I was thinking, after I finished it, I was thinking, well, what will I do next? And um, this was about 1995. And you'll remember uh, the mid 1990s was a time when a lot of Americans, especially a lot of Californians, were suddenly noticing that there were a lot of people like me moving into their neighborhoods. And it was a time of a lot of change. Uh, Pete Wilson was running uh, for re-election. There was something called Proposition 187, and for those of you who are young, I'll explain this to you. There was a ballot initiative, you know, we have these ballot initiatives every couple of years, and this particular ballot initiative was a response to the fact that there were so many immigrants. People blamed immigrants for the increase in crime, for the city being dirtier, uh, for the city being less pleasant to live in, for there being less jobs for U.S. citizens. And so Prop 187 was a measure which would have made it illegal to provide services to um, illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants. It, according to the measure, undocumented immigrants wouldn't have been allowed to go to emergency rooms or to public schools. It was passed. And so while I was writing my while I was finishing my first novel, I was seeing this um, debate unfold in California. Um, those of you, many of you uh, will remember the ads that were run uh, in support of this. Uh, Pete Wilson ran, um, and the Prop 187 campaign ran an ad uh, in which uh, Mexican immigrants could be seen running across the border at San Ysidro, and the voiceover was, they keep coming and coming. And I, as a, as a son of immigrants, was shocked by this. I had grown up in a California that was exceedingly tolerant, um, exceedingly accepting of me uh, and other uh, sons of, and daughters of Latino immigrants. And the idea um, that suddenly xenophobia would run rampant on the television and that our leading uh, politico would use xenophobia, fear of foreigners, to um, run a, a, a political campaign was made me very angry. And so um, as a writer, I thought um, I need to write a uh, response to this. I remember uh, I, lived, uh, I, wrote my, I lived in Fullerton at that time, and I remember seeing a protest coming from Fullerton College of young Latino students uh, protesting against uh, the Prop 187 campaign. And a short while later, I went back to UCI to uh, finish up my, my studies, and I was in the parking lot, and an image popped into my head for a story. And it was of a guy uh, who, uh, um, you know, uh, American guy, Californian, having to cut his own lawn because there wasn't a Mexican to cut it for him. 
Now, later, this became a movie. This was the conceit for a movie called A Day Without a Mexican. Uh, but my, I had the idea many years before. <laughs> and, and so um, I thought, you know, that's my, this image, which is actually now the image that begins the Barbary Nurseries. Um, I first wrote that uh, circa 1995. Um, and I began, I began to sort of tease out a story about the, uh, the, the current moment, the immigrant conundrum. Um, and I, I decided that I would have him as my main protagonist, an immigrant woman who would be charged with a crime. And at that time I had read, one of my favorite books still is, is Albert Camus' The Stranger, uh, which um, is required reading in many schools now. My, my teenage sons have, have read uh, that book. And so I wanted to write a book that was like that. I wanted to have a, a protagonist, this woman, this immigrant woman, who would be charged with a crime, uh, but she would be different. So we couldn't say that she was saintly. She would be an imperfect person, a human being, someone who was um, maybe not entirely likable, but she would be, a cr be charged with a crime that was not fair. And so I wrote this novel. I called it Farewell, California. And I included my experiences as a reporter. I had been a reporter for the LA Times at that time for about five years. I had covered courts. I had covered uh, the jails. I wrote a series of stories about the jail as a mental institution. So I'd actually spent a lot of time uh, in the men's central jail in Los Angeles. And so this novel became the story of this woman. Her name was Araceli, like uh, in, in a later version of the book. And um, she travels through the institutions of LA. She's in the prison and she's in the courts. And the novel I decided to end by flipping the Grapes of Wrath. So as you all know, many of you have read The Grapes of Wrath. The Grapes of Wrath is a story about this Oklahoma family that travels uh, into California and they cross the Arizona desert. There's actually a border crossing, if you'll remember, in The Grapes of Wrath where the Jodes cross into California and there is a, a posse of Californians at the border on the Colorado River trying to keep people out or, you know, and, and so Araceli, in my novel, takes the journey in the opposite direction. She's leaving California. That's why I call the novel, which was set in 1990s, early 2000s, no, 1990s California. I called it Farewell California, and I was very proud of it. It was a very political novel. It was very angry. I sent it off to my agent, uh, the now late Virginia Barber, who, um, wonderful Southern woman, who was also agent to Alice Munro, who won the Nobel Prize in literature. Uh, and so Virginia Barber took me on as a client, had sold the tattooed soldier, and she read um, the Farewell California, and she really didn't like it. She said, Hector, this is a polemic. And for those of you, uh, you know, polemic is a political argument. This is not really a novel, it's polemic. And she didn't think it would do very well, but she had a young uh, agent who was in training. He said, I think I can sell this, and he tried to sell this. His name is Jay, my agent, and still my agent to this day. And um, I, remember, um, I remember the day that I finished that novel. I finished it on September 3rd, 1996. It was the day my wife went into labor uh, with our first son. That's why I remember the date. And so by 1998, 99, uh, it, I'd finished it. It was being sent out by my, by my agent, my, uh, by uh, Jay Mandel, my new agent. And it was rejected by everyone. It did not sell. Uh, it was rejected by every house in New York, every publishing house in New York, and every publishing house in Minneapolis, and everyone in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. It was rejected by everybody. And I was devastated. I thought my career as a novelist was over. I was then 36 years old. And uh, I, you know, I, I sort of put it aside, and I wrote another book, Translation Nation, a nonfiction book. And many years later, six years after it was rejected, one day I decided, uh, I went on a, on a tour with my book, Translation Nation, and uh, many students uh, had come uh, saying, you know, we read this book, The Tattooed Soldier, your first novel. It's a great novel, you know. It's fat. When are you going to write another one? And I thought, well, maybe I should write another novel. Maybe I shouldn't just give up because I discovered that this novel I wrote, The Tattooed Soldier, in the late 1990s, um, it didn't do very well when it first came out, uh, 5,000 copies, you know, uh, very small publishing house, then later was picked up by Penguin, but still it was almost had gone out of print, 
But this novel had written, called The Tattooed Soldier, had actually found its audience um, as time went by, thanks to professors like the ones here at Cuesta College. That novel, A Tattooed Soldier, I wrote about Guatemala and LA, had been assigned in many classes. And so I'd actually written that novel, The Tattooed Soldier, before the readers for it existed. And so now the readers were like grown up. They were like 21 years old. Mr. Tobar, we love this book. It's a great novel. You know, got to write another one. And so I thought, maybe I should try again. So I went back to the manuscript of um, Farewell, California, and I picked it up. And I had written it, this was in 2005, and I had written it so many years earlier that it was, my, my backup copy was on 3.5 inch floppy disks. <laughs> and of course, I didn't have a computer that opened that anymore. But fortunately, I found a copy on an old, old laptop. And I started to read this. And I realized immediately why no one had bought my novel. Yes, because it sucked. <laughs> the primary problem with this novel, the first version of the Barbarian Nurseries, which was called Farewell, California, was that it was a novel about family, about a family, because Araceli, like in the first version, like in the version of the book many of you have read, is a woman who works for a family with two kids, or three kids, and um, I think in the first version it was two kids, but anyways, a family... Uh, is that I had written this novel about family without actually having been a dad yet. So you'll remember I told you I finished the first version of this on September 3rd, 1996. In the intervening uh, nine years, I had had three kids. And as you, many of you know, there's no greater the university than the university of parenting. And I realized that I had so much more to say uh, about, about this family. The family originally, they were just cardboard cutout figures. Now I could create a family that is a little bit based on my own. Uh, Scott and Maureen are essentially a somewhat uh, different version of myself and my wife when we lived abroad. I was a foreign correspondent. We lived in Buenos Aires in Mexico City, and we had full-time help in our house, servants living with us. An incredible luxury. And so that family I made into the family in uh, the Barbarian Nurseries. I also realized, and this is something that I, I want to say um, to uh, the students present, is that I realized that I needed to study my craft much more than I had studied it. That I was now, as I began to rewrite this novel, I was uh, approaching 40. Um, and I was past 40, actually. And I realized this is, I told myself, this is my last chance to write a novel. Uh, maybe I was being melodramatic, but you know, I'm on a Malin, okay? So, and I said, you know, I really, I really need to sort of be serious about studying my craft. Um, I also uh, remember telling myself um, that I, I needed to make it so they, make it so they can't say no. That was, that was my, my slogan for the years that I worked on this novel. Make it so they can't it, say no. And I had to study my, my craft, so I read Shakespeare for the first time in my 40s. Now, I had read Shakespeare uh, when I was a teenager in junior high school and high school, but to read Shakespeare in your 40s, ugh, what, a, what a great pleasure. First of all, I was surprised at how much sex there was in it. <laughs> Didn't remember that, you know, because the thing is that all the sex is rendered with terms for sex that no longer exist because... For some reason, well, I know why, but for some reason, terms for sex tend to change very quickly in the history of the English language. And so Shakespeare was full of all of this sex and all of this poetry. It was the high and the low. That was the genius of Shakespeare, was that he was such a kick-ass poet that all the Oxfordians were like, you know, angry with him and they were jealous of him. And at the same time, he got all the poor people to fill the seats in the Globe Theater. That was Shakespeare. So I learned that. I also told myself that I needed to read people who wrote about loss and about the middle class. And so for the American middle class, I read John Cheever. Cheever has collected stories, beautiful stories about uh, various middle class people in you know, New York and New England. I also read a lot of Alice Munro, uh, her collected stories. 
um, beautiful stories that taught me a lot about how to write fiction about family and the absolute highest level of class that I took, my own private graduate seminar, was to read Anton Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. Because The Cherry Orchard is about a family a little bit like the family in the Barbarian Nurseries. It's about a Russian family that has um, suddenly come on bad times, and they have to sell their prized cherry orchard um, uh, to make ends meet. And they sell it to a former serf, Lopatkin, and when I saw Lepot and I saw the cherry orchard performed, I thought Lapotkin, that serf who becomes like educated, that's my dad. Uh, and so the cherry orchard um, was for me this wonderful education about how to write about uh, a declassé family, a family that's losing its class status. That's why there is a um, a, a garden that's torn up in the bar in the barbarian nurseries. I had great fun destroying, building the garden and then destroying it. Uh, I went off uh, to do the research for the garden in the barbarian nurseries. I spent many hours uh, as the, at the Huntington Gardens in San Marino. Uh, the Huntington Gardens, as you know, has a beautiful desert garden, also has a subtropical, subtropical garden. I would send my kids, who by that time were then five and six years old, my boys, and I'd send them off with a piece of paper and a pencil. I said, go, go write down the names of plants, you know, and they were helping me research my novel. And, um, and so that was, I, was I had to educate myself. I had already had an MFA. I had been a writer for the LA Times. I had been a, you know, someone on the front page. I could, I could legitimately call myself a writer, but I felt insecure. I felt like I needed to educate myself about writing as art and about how to write about these deeper issues, uh, issues that required me to tap in, in, into something that I did not possess in great qualities, which was emotional intelligence. Um, and so emotional intelligence, uh, that's why I've remained married for 20 something years, is because if I got divorced, I would lose all of my emotional intelligence. And so, so uh, I, you know, I, I, I tapped into all these things and I began to uh, rewrite my novel. Now, originally in Fairwell, California, there was a crime involved with, Araceli was charged with a crime, but it involved the drowning of a boy in a pool. And I read that as a parent. When I reread it, I thought, no, I'll never kill a kid again in a book. Can't kill a kid. No more killing of children, Hector. And so instead, I made up this story of, um, of this journey, this accidental kidnapping and confusion, which is the story, for those of you who haven't read it, uh, the Barbarian Nurseries revolves around this immigrant woman who takes care of these children, of three children, uh, in, a, in, a, in a family. The, 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 the family itself, the couple has a big argument. The wife and the husband leave in different directions. The wife takes the little baby and the husband goes off by himself. And so the Araceli, the Mexican immigrant, is left with these two kids. And she's a great cook. She loves to clean, but she doesn't really like kids very much. So she wants to get rid of these kids, and so she thinks, where can I take these kids? And she realizes they have a, an uncle in South Central Los Angeles, and this was my way of getting, uh, of doing this journey with these, with these characters, from the affluent, surreal, almost gated communities of South Orange County to South Central LA, communities that I knew really well because I'd covered them, and I also lived uh, in, in, in Orange County while I was uh, a, a UCI student. So I wanted to undertake this journey from the richest part of Orange County to the poorest part of LA County. And I thought, okay, this is gonna be this interesting journey. These kids are gonna see this poverty. But I thought, you know, I had written a novel, The Tattooed Soldier, with lots of homeless people and homeless camps. I don't want this to be sad. I already did sad in the Tattooed Soldier. I don't, and plus I don't feel that sort of a, a, a correct sort of way of looking at inequality in LA. And so um, I came up with uh, an idea for this little boy, Brandon, who is the oldest boy, he's 11. And I decided that I would make him Don Quixote. Now at about this time, remember I told you I was doing all this reading, I read Don Quixote for the first time. And I read it in a beautiful translation uh, by the same woman who translates Garcia Marquez. Her name is Edith Grossman. I highly recommend it. And I spent a year and a half reading Don Quixote. 
And um, I realized that it was a work of realism. It was a work in which Cervantes is writing in the uh, 1500s, 1600s. He's describing what Spain was really like, but he's using this device of a crazy guy who reads too much romance novels and sees the romance novels playing out. Um, you know, uh, in, in Spain, he believes that the windmills are really dragons, et cetera, et cetera. So I did that with Brandon. I made him the boy who reads too much. Because about that time, I also had a son who was uh, about 11. The kids in the book are the ages my kids were when I started to write the book. And Brandon is 11, and he reads everything voraciously. And so that was great fun, was what will L.A., what will the grittiest, the dirtiest, the most poor uh, places in L.A. look like to an 11-year-old boy who's read too much YA fantasy? And, um, and so I had great fun uh, doing that. And then there was, of course, the character of Araceli herself. And Araceli um, is, to me, um, basically my entire project as a writer in one character because she is uh, essentially a subversive character. Now, I don't mean subversive, politically subversive. I mean culturally subversive. I mean that she is my attempt to tell the world, look, everything you think you know about Latino immigrants is probably wrong. I, you, we have been portrayed in the media as either, you know, criminals, drug dealers, they're rapists, they've come here to rape, you know, they, they don't send their best people. Who said, somebody said that, <laughs> right? Somebody said that. Or the other thing is like, oh, poor people, they're so, so, so sad. Look at them crossing the border. You know, this whole victimization of the Latino immigrant as essentially the innocent, you know, the innocent come to the big world, you know, of L.A., you know. No entiendo lo que está pasando aquí, señor. You know, those are the two uh, opposites of the way Latino immigrants are portrayed in cinema and literature um, I, I just, I, I, I was, I objected uh, to that as, as a citizen of the, Los, of the United States, as a son of Latino immigrants, and as a writer, it was just bad literature. And so my antidote to that was to make Araceli someone like a lot of people that I know in my orbit was to make her a working class wannabe intellectual. So that's essentially my father. My father is someone who had a fourth grade education in Guatemala, came to the United States, got his high school equivalency at LA Trade Tech, his AA degree at a place like this, LA City College, community college, and who his whole life was someone who had a limited education but was a snob. <laughs> you know, uh, My father worked parking cars, and he worked, um, he, uh, worked in hotels. He was a, a front office um, a clerk at the Beverly Hilton in Beverly Hills. And despite his limited education uh, and his limited means, he would tell me things like, Hector, the worst thing that could ever happen to you is to be around uneducated people. <laughs> and, uh, and so I gave that sort of chip on the shoulder to Araceli, which is a chip in the shoulder that I have, uh, to be honest. And so she is an intellectual uh, trapped in the body of a servant. She's my feminine alter ego. Her, her sarcastic observations about uh, Los Angeles life are my sarcastic observations about Los Angeles life. Um, the things that she admires about the United States, like the idea that you can have a public defender and that you, they, they actually don't steal your belongings when they arrest you, but return them to you when you're released. Uh, I have the same admiration for American democracy. And her horror at... Um, the perversions of the justice system where basically it makes more sense to plead guilty to a crime you didn't commit than to try to fight it. Her outrage is my outrage. And her desire to be recognized as an artist is my, rec my desire to be recognized as an artist. I really would never have called myself an artist until I wrote this book, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about, uh, more about that in a second. Um, so this, this sort of internal struggle is my internal struggle, and that is really what Araceli stands for. Um, so the, and that is like a direct kind of 
subversion of what many people consider the immigrant to be. Um, one of the reasons why the novel is called The Barbarian Nurseries is that um, there is this image of Mexico in certain cable news uh, programs and on certain AM radio programs of Mexico as a place without civilization, right? It's a place where they're cutting people's heads off, people can't read and write, you know, it's this wild place. So it's this barbarian place, and yet it's also a place that produces people who raise plants, take care of our plants, they take care of the plants in the medium, they take care of the gardens, they cut the lawns. That's what the nursery is. A nursery is a place where plants are raised. So the, it's the barbarian gardeners, but also nursery means a place where you raise children in the creche. And as many of you know, uh, oftentimes in American family homes, it is an immigrant woman who is taking care of uh, the children, helping to raise the children. So they are like the barbarian nanny. So that's why I called it the barbarian nurseries. And yet Araceli is this person who um, has intellectual aspirations and she is also absolutely astonished, as I am, by the variety of life in California. California is one of the great creations of global civilization. It's a place where all these different groups mix and meet. Um, there are, is a Korean uh, and a woman in my uh, novel who dreams of the Korean Beverly Hills. There actually is a Korean Beverly Hills in LA. There is Spanish and Spanglish spoken, that mixing of Central Mexican Spanish and English. Um, there, is, there are neighborhoods now, communities like Huntington Park that are, um, have long histories uh, of being working class communities which, which are now run essentially by people of Mexican descent. I had great fun uh, describing Huntington Park, which is really is many different communities. It's all of Southeast LA, kind of squeezed into one town. Um, I, I had, for, there is a scene, for example, where uh, Araceli, my editor asked me to add one more, one more scene in the middle of the book. And unfortunately, this is supposed to be on the 4th of July. And so I thought, well, what could happen on the 4th of July? And, um, and so that's why I begin this book with this idea, of the section of the book with the silence of the 4th of July, the quiet on fourth, the morning of the 4th of July. And I was sitting in my house in Mount Washington, LA, thinking how will I fill up this day of silence when at six o'clock in the morning, when I usually wake up to write, I heard all of these bird uh, songs. And I thought, that's it. I'll fill it with the sounds of nature Right, we as Angelinos, uh, well not so much here of course, but though in Southern California, we don't hear the birds sing all the time. Uh, we don't realize we live in a natural setting. Uh, and so I, uh, I thought I'm going to have these bird calls in my book, but I want them to be authentic. You know, verisimilitude is extremely important in writing a novel. And being a reporter, and I did this over and over again in many instances in my book, but in this particular case, I called the leading bird expert in Los Angeles County. Uh, and uh, Kimball Garrett at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And I had interviewed him before uh, about birds. And so I called him up and I said, Kimball, what kind of birds will there be uh, on a summer day in Huntington Park? And he said, give me half an hour and I'll get back to you. And he consulted his as yet unpublished Bird Atlas of Los Angeles County looked up the grid for Southgate and woodpeckers, comorants, all these wonderful birds that are in, those birds that you see in that passage of the book, those are actual birds that you would find in Huntington Park. And so for me it was that book, this book, is also a celebration of the variety of natural and human life uh, in, in Los Angeles County, in Southern California. But it's also a celebration and a work of denunciation uh, about our institutions. Um, I covered the criminal courts and the jail system for the Los Angeles Times. It was an I'm, I just feel incredibly privileged to be able to sit in a courthouse and watch people being arraigned is, a one, is an incredible, I, I was gonna say wonderful, but that's not the right word. It is an incredibly powerful and eye-opening insight uh, into the way American democracy works. And um, the same with the court system. Uh, Araceli um, finds her way uh, into the court system. She's charged with a crime. Um, 
there is one instance in which um, she, uh, she they describe the um, the sort of what happens a time one of the her public defender describes what happens time and again, which is that people come in to the public and into the superior court, they are found uh, they are found not guilty or they are given a suspended sentence, and they believe they're about to be released, but, a, and, but they're being whispered instructions into their ear, which basically tells them you are going to be released to the custody of ICE and deported back to Mexico. And I saw this, I saw this in a courthouse in LA, a grown man crying, weeping, because he was about to be released into the custody of ICE and taken away from his family. And so the novel is also a description of this incredibly divided, incredibly uh, unique, uh, filled with variety society called Southern California. And I grind through that novel to the end. I finished it in 2010, and um, I showed it to my agent, who took four or five months to get back to me. And when he finished it, he said, uh, Hector, I really, uh, I really love this novel. It's a masterpiece. And it has since sold in several languages. Um, the, the la it sold in Britain and it sold in Italian. In Italian, it was translated into German. In Italian, it's called uh, Barbarian Summer. <laughs> in France, it's called a Printemps Barbar, Barbarian Spring. Um, in German, it's in der Hausen der Barbaren, in the homes of the barbarians. And, uh, but, but the highlight of, of my tour with, uh, with the Barbarian Nurseries was going to Paris and going uh, and, stay, and being put up in a hotel by my publisher. Well, actually, the first time I went there, I paid my own way. But the second time I went, I was invited by my publisher for a festival, and I was interviewed. The French love to read foreign literature. They um, consume vast amounts of, for, of, of literature in translation. They have armies of translators translating novels from Spanish, from Swedish, from Polish, from German, from Russian, and from English. And so I got to meet my English translators, and I learned, uh, I, I remember asking, why, why is the word roman on my novel? It says, you know, uh, roman, well, roman means novel in French. And the word for novelist uh, in, in French is romancier. And I thought, oh, je suis romancier. Je suis romancier américain. And, and that was, for me, it was the completion of a journey, uh, because uh, I, had I had decided to become a writer because I really wanted to honor my father's sense of what education was, that education made us feel powerful, it made us feel smart. It basically showed the people around us that we were human, that we were fully human, that we were people capable of learning. There's a wonderful expression in Spanish, gente de razón, you know, people of reason. Um, and so my career as a writer has been an attempt to show the world um, that I was a person of reason and not just another, uh, uh, you know, uh, brown-skinned uh, immigrant, that I was someone who was a brown-skinned immigrant who could also think and write and maybe dream of changing the world. And my reward was to go to Paris and be called a romancier. <laughs> and with that, I want to say thank you, and I will take your questions. There are microphones here. Thank you. That was wonderful. Please come up to the side microphones. While people are coming up, I just want to add a few more thank yous. I forgot to thank not only the San Luis Obispo County Library, who is our, our co-sponsor and brings so many of you in with wonderful events and book clubs. I forgot to thank all of the people that actually do the work, which is the, the um, Book of the Year committee made up of faculty and library staff and uh, even some of our Cuesta folks that have gone to work other places and are still helping us out. And I forgot to thank you who have been coming to our events for about eight years now, and I'm so grateful that you're still here. And please tell us what our next book is going to be. So we'll start with the Yes, thank you. And there's also a microphone over here. Uh, sir, your question. Monsieur Romancier. Uh, Romancier. Merci, merci. <laughs> Uh, what, can you say again what the uh, translator, or what the, what the edition was of Don Quixote that you liked so well? What was the, what, I'm sorry? The, the, tra the translator? The lady oh, the translator, translator was uh, Edith Grossman. 
Edith Grossman. East, Edith Grossman. It's a red uh, cover of a book with a shield of a, of a knight on the front. Yes. Okay. It's and then I, and then I, have a, I have a very brief comment that uh, deep down dark is outstanding. And I'm, oh. a, I'm a mining guy. You got everything just right. Oh, thank you. I even worked for a thank you. mining company. Um, he's referring to my book on the Chilean miners, uh, Deep Down Dark, The Untold Stories of 33 Men Buried in the Chilean Mine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yes, ma'am. As a graduate of South Pasadena High School, mm. I was wondering how you happened to choose South Pasadena as uh, the destination for that family. Well, um, I live in Mount Washington, which is very close to South Pasadena. And um, it's, I, I describe it as the next hill over from Dodger Stadium. So Mount Washington is between Dodger Stadium and South Pasadena, and so I, I go to South Pasadena all the time. Um, my daughter is in the, enrolled in the South Pasadena Little League. Um, I wrote most of, I, when I came to the United States, after um, living in Mexico, I wrote the final chapters of the Barbarian Nurseries in Buster's a Cafe in South Pasadena. And, um, and I wrote my, my last book, I wrote a big chunk of it in a studio in South Pasadena. So for me, South Pasadena was just a kind of shorthand for middle class American life. I mean, I think that I remember going to South Pasadena after I had lived in Mexico and in Buenos Aires. And one thing that really um, shocked me was that you could drive through South Pasadena and not see any bars on the windows and then you could drive by and see into people's houses because in Mexico City, people of the same economic status, uh, at, you know, they, they build walls uh, in front of their houses and they have steel doors. Uh, and so that openness for me uh, was, was, was remarkable after having been away for so many years. I, I lived seven years abroad. Um, and also the style of craftswood architecture, it is a Midwestern creation. Uh, as many of you know, and that openness of the craftsman style. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I thought of that, and that's older, you know, the communities that the, where the novel starts are gated communities that have this sort of faux ranch style architecture, and so much of it is closed, right? Um, uh, by definition, a gated community is somewhere you just can't wander into, whereas a community like South Pasadena is still, for the time being at least, open to um, the world, you know, it's a place you can wander through, and that openness of American middle class life is something that I really treasure. I think that the coolest thing about being an American is that we have a big middle class, because it makes it makes it tends to make people friendlier in in class. Uh, you know, when they're when people of different classes meet, they are friendlier than they would be, let's say, in Mexico City or Buenos Aires. Now we have lots of other problems, but so South Pasadena for me is symbolizes that. So thank you for asking. Uh, yes. Hi. Yeah, we read uh, your book in our book club, so thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I also kind of have this conversation in my head a lot that you talked about, and I wondered if you could expand further about your journey from journalist to artist. Oh, well, thank you. I, um, my journey from journal journalist to artist is, um, well, I, I found over the long run that the two different kinds of writing really teach a lot to each other. So as a journalist, you, are, um, you go and you gather facts, and you go to places that you ordinarily wouldn't go. Like I said, I went to jails, and I went to um, I, crime scenes, uh, hurricanes, disasters. So being a journalist really is a great instruction in humanity. Um, and so that, that was to me uh, the foundation of my work as a novelist. But being a novelist means that you fully embrace the power of language and the beauty of language. Um, something my last couple of books have taught me that one of the reasons why people read is not just because they want the information in a book or because they want uh, to be transported someplace, that we also love to read because reading makes us human, and we love language. We love the power of language. The English language is a beautiful language that has borrowed words from other languages and all kinds of invented uh, words uh, invented by, by poor people and rich people. And, you know, and so, um, so to me, being a novelist taught me to um, let it rip as a writer, to let it rip in terms of language, to really lose myself 
in the power of language. So that then taught the journalist how to be a better writer. So when I wrote this miner's book, I wrote it like, even though it was a work of journalism and nonfiction, I wrote it like a novelist, so I got inside the heads of my characters. So the two things have really taught me a lot. Um, I became a, a, a short story writer and a novelist because I felt my writing as a journalist wasn't quite up to par. And so I, I began to, um, to read more widely and eventually I fell in love with writing fiction and that's why I began to write fiction. Now I'm writing a novel after writing a nonfiction book, which is this novel about a real person, but it's a novel and so it's, it's been a wonderful journey and I'm still learning to this day. One thing I highly recommend uh, is if any of you love books, there's a wonderful podcast about Frank, uh, excuse me, about Ulysses, James Joyce's Ulysses, which is one of those books that no one can understand, right? And many of us have been defeated by it. Now, I am listening to this podcast by Frank Delaney. You can just type Frank Delaney Ulysses podcast in any Google browser. And it's a wonderful journey, one paragraph at a time. He describes this world of Dublin in 1904, on one day in 1904. And, uh, and so I am still sort of trying, every day is an education. And now I'm in the world of Ulysses and it's changing the way I write. And that's another thing I like to tell writing students is that your education really should never end when you, when you become a writer. So that kind of habit I learned from wanting to be a novelist. Yes. Another question over here? Yes. Thank you. You haven't talked much about Scott and Maureen. And they are such wonderfully drawn characters oh, well, thank you. that I think a lot of us can relate to their struggle. So I wonder if you would just flesh them out a little bit for oh, us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I know um, Maureen is a character that a lot of book clubs have arguments about, <laughs> about Maureen. Um, well, Scott and Maureen are based on many different kinds of things, but mostly they're my wife and I living in that house with the servant, you know? That's, that's the most important part of it. But um, uh, not, not only that, I also, I've lived long enough that I've seen like three or four tech crashes, right? There's, I guess we're due for another one any minute now. Look out, right? <laughs> so there's, you know, we, so I had some friends who started a software company and they started the software company and it, you know, and then they, and they went off and had these adventures and, the, and then the company was taken from them, it collapsed, and then he started another one. And so that whole backdrop of the tech company, uh, you know, going under with Scott, Scott and Scott working for the tech company, that's something that's drawn from my own circle of California friends. The family itself is the way I sort of felt when I lived in Mexico City in Buenos Aires and I had full-time help. So my, in my family, you know, my, my grandmother was a domestic. <laughs> my mother at one point worked as a domestic. I have a cousin who was a domestic in Beverly Hills. My aunt worked her entire life in a mansion in Beverly Hills. I remember being a little kid and going and visiting my aunt on the days when the family went to Europe for their vacation. And I remember entering this mansion in Beverly Hills to go into the pool. Don't touch anything. Just go straight to the pool. Don't touch anything. And I'd you know, walk through this mansion and there'd be all kinds of like musical instruments everywhere and pictures you know, and porcelain and everything and I tiptoe across the marble uh, to, the, to the swimming pool. So my, I feel like I have a unique perspective. I know what it's like to be the employer of the domestic and I also know what it's like to be the family of the domestic. So when you live in that situation, it's extremely odd um, to have someone living in your house, in a room in your house and in Latin America, the rooms where the domestic live, it's a very distinct space because it usually doesn't have the same fixtures as the rest of the house, okay? And it's, uh, the, the floor is gonna be, you might have marble in the main house, but the domestic's room in the back has an entrance in the back, its own entrance, and it has like linoleum, you know? So for me, this was like mind-shattering kind of observations. At one point, one of our domestics in Mexico City was gone for the weekend. We were always, my wife was trying to have us remember what it was like to not have domestics. So she would tell the people, women, to leave Friday and not come back until Sunday night. So they would leave on Friday and we'd have a couple of days and one day I had to go look for something and I entered her space and I could see this whole other space that was in my house that didn't belong to me. So a lot of that is based on um, 
on me and being this person with a domestic, but also Scott himself, him being half Mexican and from South Whittier. Well, I'm from South Whittier. And I bear a grudge against South Whittier to this day. <laughs> I still haven't got my full revenge for what South Whittier did to me. So, uh, <laughs> so it's all drawn from all those things. Yes, thanks for asking. Great question. Yes. I was wondering about your choice of not always translating the Spanish. Oh. And like, were there versions where you did translate throughout and then you decided it wasn't necessary? Or how did you think about your reader when you were making those choices? Wow, what a great question. Um, it's wonderful when you have an audience where they've read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I, my, you see, my default as a journalist when I worked at the LA Times was you could never have any Spanish that wasn't translated unless it was like amigo or something, you know? <laughs> Everybody knew what it meant because they, you know, the whole LA would turn against you. You know, they would be beating down the walls of Time Mirror Square. Get him out of here, <laughs> you know? So my, originally I had all the Spanish in my novel and I would translate it every once in a while. And my editor, Sean McDonald, who doesn't speak Spanish, happens also to have been the editor of Juno Diaz. So, yes, so Juno Diaz wrote this wonderful novel, many books, but he wrote a wonderful novel that Sean edited called uh, The Wondrous Life, uh, The Short Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. And Juno is, has, is so full of life and such a linguistic acrobat that he is not only writing untranslated Spanish, he's got Puerto, he's got Dominican slang, he's got uh, erudite English theory terms, and he's got everything. And so he had an am amazing amount of wordplay. And so, Sh so Sean told me, let's try to translate as little as possible. Because if you have some untranslated Spanish, then it sort of recreates the sort of sense of confusion, you know, that you might have in LA. You might be in, many of us have been in LA, gone to a store and heard Spanish or Chinese or been to a car wash and heard Armenian spoken, you know? And like, what is going on? And so uh, he, we decided to keep that from, and I liked it because what it did, what happens, and it's so common now, it's, it's to me a, a, a silly affectation of much Latino art, Latino American uh, literature and uh, drama, is you'll go to see a play and someone will be speaking and they'll have to translate everything they're saying, mijo, my son, you know, no te vayas, don't leave, you know? <laughs> and it just seems ridiculous. And so it makes everything seem, it makes the Spanish kind of, the whole thing being juvenile. And so that was behind the decision. And then I'm really proud of all the different layers of English and Spanish in it because there is correct Mexican Spanish there's also Central American Spanish, which is a little bit of a different accent. We have a different pronoun in Spanish. Vos, uh, andate, andate la mierda, uh, is an expression, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, a common Central American expression, and um, it means go to hell, but it, mierda means sh shit in Spanish. So, uh, and so, so I had fun playing with all of that. There's also, there are words in LA Spanish that don't exist in actual Spanish, you know? And so, and these are, it's a pigeon. LA Spanish is a pigeon. There, there are people who study this. There are linguists. Uh, one of the most fascinating things I've ever learned about Chicano English is that there's a kind, there's a kind, I don't want to imitate it now, but there's a kind of East LA English, okay? That English has rhythms that come from the Spanish of Central Mexico. But the Spanish of Central Mexico has rhythms, intonations, that come from Nahuatl. So when you go to East LA or you know, LA and you hear a guy speaking with a really thick Chicano accent, he actually, you're hearing echoes of Nahuatl. So it's, that's the linguistic universe. It's extremely interesting to me and I wish I could knew more languages. Yes, where's next, over here, yes. Um, in your talk today, when you were describing writing about the character Brandon as mm -hmm. a sort of little Don Quixote, yes, um, it sounded like you really delighted in his perspective of L.A. through the lens of the young adult novels that he had read. 
And it surprised me because my reaction when I was reading that was I was kind of horrified because mm. I thought, here's this kid who goes to this expensive private school and reads a lot, and he really is so ignorant about the world around him. And so I thought that you were trying to critique our education system. And <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm wondering is, did that concern you, or do you think it's actually just really sweet and you're not worried because oh. when he gets older, he'll figure things out? <laughs> well, it is a critique, but it's not a critique of the education system. It's a critique of the huge class divide in California. It's a critique of the idea that you could grow up sheltered from so many of the horrible things about California, you know? So that's really, there is a critique there. There is an element of satire involved in that. Now, once I got started on that, I truly enjoyed, um, you know, his voice. I, you know, he has this one soliloquy in which he describes to a probation officer everything he's seen, and uh, I had so much fun writing that because, you know, and then he mixes up uh, the guy, I forgot the guy's name, uh, you know, they're chanting something, yeah. Reforma, yeah, Reforma, yeah, it was Reforma, they were talking about a guy, Reforma. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun doing that, but, uh, so there is two, those are both things involved, it's both a, it's a device that's meant to sort of say, look, look at our world, look how huge these gaps are, and it's our time, this is our state, and at the same time, it's a writer having a lot of fun, both things at the same time. More Just two more, okay. two more questions, yes, do you have a question? I really appreciate you talking about the, the genesis of some of your characters. And I'm wondering, is there a magical moment when that character's voice takes on a, a, just a, a tone of its own and starts uh, really becoming real to you? And did your characters do that in differing degrees uh, as you were writing? Yeah, I think that there definitely is a moment where you, you really believe that the person you're writing is a, her own person. And for me, that really wasn't until I started to rewrite this novel. You know, when I, um, when I began to rewrite it uh, in 2005, six years after it was rejected, and I began to sort of uh, to create her fully. And, to, and I think that also making Scott and Maureen real people allowed me to make Araceli crazier, you know? And because if she had just been crazy on her own, it would have just been too much. But her being balanced out by this very recognizable sort of American couple, I think that allowed me more license. And I remember, um, uh, I remember my editor asking me to create one more scene with Araceli, and I had to fill up, I had to imagine this party that takes place in Huntington Park, and I was just exhausted. I couldn't be her anymore, you know? I was, I was like, do I have anything left in the tank? Because she has her own logic to her, and so I didn't, I, I don't want it, to me it all feels true. She feels like a real person. So it's not like I'm, it's not like she is like this shadow person that I can move her hands and make her do whatever I want. She has her own things that she wants to do. And, um, and I, I know, I know, I miss that because now I'm working on a novel that's about a real person who left behind all these letters, and I have to feel my way into him, and I'm still sort of struggling to feel that I am him. And it's something that I think is, that, that's what you have to aim for as a novelist. You have to aim for that level of empathy um, where um, you really can feel the person from the inside. Yes, definitely. Last question, sir. Hi, Hector. Thanks a lot. Um, so it seems like in your novel, there, there's a relationship between class and class status and lo one, losing one's cultural identity, especially right. with respect to, to Scott. Can you talk about that relationship between class economic status, losing your cultural identity, being disconnected, uh, even being from South Whittier versus right. like being from Boyle Heights or Huntington Park? Or well, I, I sort of see class as sort of the great unspoken reality of California that we sort of don't really address. And I feel like at a place here, you know, where you have uh, a racially mixed um, student body, but I really do feel they are united in their class status, you know? I, I really feel that. Um, it's something that, um, that isn't really uh, spoken. I feel it now in Oregon, too. I, I teach in Oregon. You would think, you know, people say, oh, our school is not very diverse, but it is. I mean, even though it's mostly white, because there's a lot of poor kids from little 
old logging towns in Oregon or towns that are, uh, have seen better days. And so for me, class is extremely important uh, in the novel. Um, and there are just so many layers of identity, in, of Latino identity in that book. And that's one of the other things that I'm really proud of in that book is that there are people who are 100% identified as Mexican, like Araceli, who's very proud of being a Mexicana, even though she's kind of changing a little bit. She doesn't quite realize it yet, but she's changing. And then there are people who grew up with a strong sense of their Mexicanness, but don't really speak Spanish very well, you know? Um, like that one blogger who I created. I really enjoyed writing him and uh, his whole sort of take on who his readers were. As he said, the Latino intelligentsia, such as they are, you know? An unpublished novelist, untenured professors, unheralded poets. And so um, I, I really took a lot of pleasure in that. Uh, in describing all those layers uh, of identity. And that's one of the joys of living in California, is that not only, not only is there such variety, there's so much possibilities. You can be almost anything you want in this country, uh, in this state. Um, there are just so, it's, identity is such a free-flowing thing. So many of us have mixed families, mixed marriages, as more common than ever before. Um, especially in Southern California, I almost everyone I know is in a family where there is some sort of uh, national, ethnic, class, racial mixing going on, Jewish, Irish, Armenian, uh, Korean, uh, Chinese, Filipino, um, all mixing together. And uh, so that was one of the great joys of, is in writing that book. But yet what unites us um, really is this appreciation for um, the institutions that have been, been built here, for our democratic institutions, for this way of getting along that we Californians have. I think we should be proud of that. Generally speaking, if you get 50 Californians in a room together, they will find a way to all get along together. And I'm proud of that as a Californian, and the Barbarian Nurseries is in part also about that. So I will sign any books too, right, also, if anybody has any. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, and um, give uh, Mr. Tobar a second to just sneak out the back door there, and um, he will be ready to sign your books. There's also books for sale, and um, thanks again for coming.